guys, today we're going to talk about Death Camp Treblinka. Um, so this is technically Treblinka 2, just like Auschwitz had Auschwitz 1, 2, and 3. This is Treblinka 2. Treblinka 1 was a work or concentration camp. Um, so Death Camp Treblinka, or Treblinka 2, um, is the second most deadly camp um, out of all the death camps, but it was also a really cool story because the prisoners of this camp actually had a successful or somewhat successful revolt and it ended up shutting down the camp permanently so very very cool um a situation that was not the case at most camps concentration or death camps so uh we're gonna learn about that today so Treblinka II, its construction was finished in July 1942. It was positioned near the Polish village of Wolka, um, and it was actually built right on the railroad for ease of transporting victims so that they could very clearly and very easily get everybody into the camp. Um, now, the camp was hidden. It was kind of in the middle of a forest. Um, it had really tall fences, so you couldn't see what was going on. It was not like directly next to any villages, so it was very, very secretive and very hidden. Um, the camp itself had three parts, a reception area, a living area, and a killing area. So the living area contained administrative offices, barracks or housings for the Nazi Ukrainian police, storerooms, workshops, and barracks for up to 700 prisoners. Um, at most, they would usually only keep about 300 prisoners. So your guard to prisoner ratio was actually very close to like one to two to one, one to one. So um, very small prisoner population. Uh, reception area. This is where inmates or prisoners were taken off of the train, sorted by age and sex. Hair was shaven. Uh, valuables were taken and sorted. It also contained a building that they called the hospital, um, which was really just a small building that had a fence around it. Um, and then behind the fence was just a giant pit. And so they would take people to the hospital and bring them out back and shoot them. So really horrific. Um, last but not least, the killing area. This was originally only contained three gas chambers. Um, they were labeled showers, but then as they wanted to process more Jews more quickly, um, they eventually increased it to 10 gas chambers and several mass graves. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the camp looked like. So if you look up here, we have our extermination area. It's literally almost what, like a quarter of the camp right there. Um, so this would be your gas chambers. This would be these little gray areas are your mass graves. Um, so then we have um, right over here, this is your hospital. Um, like I said, or I'm, I'm sorry, that's not the hospital, that's the latrine. Um, 22 would be the hospital. You can tell that because it has the mass grave around it. This would be a fence. And this little tiny building right there would be the quote-unquote hospital. Um, 18, this is where men were taken. So you would have people get off the trains right here. Men would go this way, women would go this way, and they would both go up. Um, we call it the stairway to heaven, um, which at least that was the prisoner nickname for it. Um, it is the road to the gas chambers. Um, so you have your gas chambers and then your mass graves. And I noticed right over here, um, anybody that died during transportation, so on the railway, was buried here on 23. Um, 20 guys, that's the barracks where the prisoners were forced to live. So they were literally right next to a mass grave. Um, this huge section over here is actually all for officers um, and Nazis and um, running the camp, essentially. So. This, um, this area alone was for prisoners, so, uh, yeah. All right, going to our next one. So talking about our officers, so from August 1942 to November 1943, Franz Stongel was the commander of the camp. Um, now, the camp did officially kind of shut down in August, but there was some work done afterwards to kind of conceal it, which we'll talk about. On average, you had about 25 to 35 officers, which were usually your Gestapo, your SS, or your Nazis, and then they normally had about 90 to 150 Ukrainian guards. Um, 
So, um, deportations. Um, they had approximately 265,000 people from the Warsaw Ghetto that were processed at this camp. Uh, 346,000 from uh, Radom District. Um, 110,000 from Valiostok. 33,000 from Lubin, 8,000 from Derenstadt in Bohemia, and then several from Greece, Yugoslavia, Germany, Austria, France, and Slovakia. Um, so these were the like larger ghettos that were being emptied and all the prisoners were being sent here. So you can see um, train has pulled up. You've got people coming out. Um, so men would be going one way, women would go the other way. This right here, guys, is a giant mound of clothing. They processed so many prisoners every single day that it never got any smaller than that. Um, prisoners tried to like escape and hide by building tunnels in this mound of clothing. Um, it's also the only one of the only reasons they kept prisoners around was to have prisoners sort through the clothing. Um, so right over here, you can see your hospital and you can see the pits right behind it where people would be shot and killed. These two buildings right here, this is where your prisoners who are being forced to work would live. Um, uh, and this is actually a fake railway station. It had like little fake signs of uh, Yugoslavia this way, um, Poland this way. So just really kind of horrific the extent they went to to kind of like hide from the prisoners um, or the inmates that were being transported what was happening um, so prisoners um, it says 700 to 900 I think in some cases it was as small as three to four hundred uh, but they were used to carry out camp duties um, if you compare that to Auschwitz's 60,000 prisoners that they regularly kept um, it's a very very small number um, working so being chose to work was only temporary survival um, they worked in the reception area the sorting area the clean they clean train cars um, they were forced to put people into the gas chambers they were forced to take people the dead bodies out of the gas chambers um, so just really uh, it was not a pleasant thing to be chosen for work um, now, originally, when you were chosen to work, you only lived for that one day, if that. Sometimes it would only be a few hours. You would be killed when the next shipment of Jews arrived, and then they would force those Jews to work, um, or the small portion that they picked to work. Now, um, eventually they realized that that just wasn't effective because they kept having to retrain people. Um, so they did start keeping them around from anywhere to about three to six months, um, but you were lucky if you lasted that long. So the killing process, um, trains of 50 to 60 cars um, would pull up, but only 20 cars at a time would unload the people. So if you remember when Ellie first gets in the train car, they put 80 people, so 80 times 20, um, and that would be the amount of people that you would regularly have pulling up at a time. And like I said, um, men would go one way, women would go the other way. Um, they were shaved, their cloth, clothing was taken, any items, valuables. Um, they did not tattoo them. So think about that and what that kind of implies. Um, sick prisoners, elderly, and infants would be sent to the lazarette, which is the hospital, which I kind of pointed out is that little tiny building with a giant pit behind it. Um, the tube, aka the way to heaven or the stairs to heaven, um, was this right here. You can see it comes up and comes into, this would be the gas chamber. So you can see they have four, I'm sorry, five on this one side and they would have five on the other. So each of these would be kind of like an entrance to a gas chamber. Um, gas chambers were labeled showers, so the prisoners did not fight back. They just willingly went into the gas chambers, um, and by the time they started to realize that it was not actually a shower, it was too late. Um, usually the last few would start to kind of like freak out and fight back, and at that point 
they would often be stabbed or um, forced in in one way or another. Um, this is our lazarette, our hospital. Had a little red cross flag, um, very heavily camouflaged. You could not see around. Um, and then you have this huge pit for bodies. Um, and we're going to talk about the bodies and the um, what they did with them um, in a little bit. So gas chambers, like I said, they were labeled showers. They were originally um, three, which meant they could only process about 300 to 500 people per hour. Um, they eventually increased it to 10, which meant they could process 1,000 to 2,000 people per hour. Um, so if you think about that, that would be about the same as killing um, the entire student population of Biloxi High School in an hour. Um, it took about 15 minutes for people to suffocate. Um, and then our temporary survival inmates, or our work inmates, the Jews that were chosen to work, um, were forced to remove the bodies. And if you think about it, these were those bodies, or at least originally, of the same exact group they came in on. So they were removing their relatives, their friends, their neighbors, their dead bodies out of this building. Um, so just the psychological horror and physical horror of that. It's just overwhelming. Um, so just another picture of a recreation. Um, all right, so let's talk about the bodies and the mass graves. So originally, the bodies, um, both at the lazarettes so of the hospital and um, around the um, the gas chambers, were all just giant uh, mass graves, so giant pits where they just threw the bodies in and buried them. Um, well, eventually, towards the end of the war, they decide that it's not sanitary. Um, there's some debate over whether that was really the cause or if the Nazis were just trying to hide evidence even more. Um, but either way, they forced um, prisoners to dig up these giant mass graves of rotting bodies and set them on fire. And so they burned these giant mass graves, so just huge open pits of flame, just burning bodies and they burned so hot that a lot of times there weren't even bones left. Um, so again, just really horrific. Um, because there are so few bones and bodies because of how hot and how long these flames uh, burned, there's a lot of doubt over whether this camp actually existed um, uh, or that that was actually as deadly as people claim it was. Um, so now we're going to get to the really exciting, really cool part, uh, the revolt. So in early 1943, prisoners started planning a secret revolt. Uh, prisoners were afraid, afraid that at the end of the final solution, so when they finally emptied out all those Jewish ghettos, they would be killed and that the evidence of them would also be covered up, just like they're covering up these mass graves by burning them. So August 2nd, 1943, prisoners got weapons but were caught. Um, when that happened, that's when the revolt started. So over 300 escaped, but two-thirds of that were caught and killed. So about 200, only 100 escaped. Um, the revolt caused the end of Treblinka. The prisoners wanted to actually burn the camp to the ground. They wanted to completely shut it down. They were not successful in that, but they did end up shutting the camp down. Um, so they did that um, by just damaging it enough that it was not feasible to rebuild. So in July 1942 to August 1943, 870,000 people to 925,000 people were killed. Uh, anyone who didn't escape, or if they were caught, so remember, two-thirds were caught, so 200 people had to help dismantle the remains of the camp, which is why um, Franz Stongel was in charge until November, because it took until November to get rid of the evidence. Um, and then, even more messed up, they built a farm over the site to further hide the fact of the death camp, the fact the death camp was there. 
Um, now, uh, there is a memorial there today. Um, this is actually, I believe, part of the gas chamber that was left. Um, and we're going to talk about these stones in just a second. Um, okay, uh, I just want us to kind of compare. So this is the second most deadly camp. Like I said, estimates for deaths range from 870,000 to 925,000 and only operated for 13 months. That's it. That's how many people it killed in literally just over a year. Where if you compare to Auschwitz, which is the most deadly camp, it killed somewhere between 1.1 to 1.3 million people, but it operated for four and a half years. That's 54 months. Could you imagine if Treblinka 2 had operated for 54 months? the amount of deaths it would have, absolutely horrific. All right, so let's talk about these stones now. Um, as you can see, it's a huge field of stones, huge, huge, huge. Each of those stones, if you look, has, it's a really terrible picture, sorry guys, but has a um, name written on it. That is the name of an entire town or village um, or kind of like hamlet that was the entire Jewish population was wiped out. So each of those stones represents the entire jo Jewish population of an entire town gone because of this camp. Um, it's really hard to like comprehend the amount of people that represents. So now we are going to get to our article that we're reading. Um, so what I did was I took an informational article and I combined it with a firsthand account of somebody that was part of the revolt. Um, I thought it was really cool, but I still wanted you to get some like factual information. So we're gonna go ahead and read this together real quick. Um, and obviously just like any Ed Puzzle, there will be questions that kind of pause you throughout. So. The camp staff, composed of about 30 German soldiers, was afraid of the resistance of the people brought to Treblinka. Reinforced precautions had already taken the Treblinka railway station, and prisoners chosen for work party were regularly killed. The prisoners realized that working only for a short time prolonged their lives. The only effective weapon was escape. All those who undertook escape and were caught were killed, often in great tortures. The prisoners from a given unit were punished for successful escapes. Usually 10 people were shot for one fugitive. The prisoners in the camp realized that the only way out was an armed uprising, because then they would either die in battle or escape. A secret committee was founded, first in Camp 1, then in Camp 2. The prisoners formed fives, groups of five people each, and if possible, they gathered blunt tools, wooden boards, and pegs needed to push through the wire fence so that they could escape, as well as petrol to sell the build, set the buildings on fire. The committee decided that the hour for the revolt had arrived. In the camp, there were a number of so-called courtus, or pipels, who humiliated themselves in the service of the Germans. Some of them had a certain freedom of movement within the camp. At times, they often found it possible to approach the armory. These privileged individuals were all very young. The command decided to entrust to these boys the task of expropriating a hundred hand grenades from the armory on the day of the revolt. They proved to be well chosen for the desk. Um, and notice guys, anything that is in bold and in italics just like that will be part of the first hand account. The stuff that's just in like Times New Roman, so this, um, is going to be the informational article. So that's how I kind of did the separation. So this bold and italics will be the firsthand account. The Times New Roman, just kind of plain, is gonna be the actual informational article. All right, paragraph five. In July, 1943, the burning of the excavated corpses was basically completed. The transports came less and less frequently and prisoners feared that the liquidation would take place any day. The formation of a secret committee was possible due to smaller rotation of prisoners when their personal status stabilized. The staff assured the prisoners that they would stay alive if they worked well. So they started going through prisoners less and less often. Like I said, people were being kept alive somewhere between three to six months instead of just for one day or for a few hours. In the meantime, our activities increased. Dr. Leiko Reingro, 
chosen by the Nazis from a new batch of Jews to replace Dr. Krasinski, eventually became a member of the committee. A Czech also joined us, Rudolf Masaryk, a relative of the late president of Czechoslovakia. He had refused to abandon his wife, a Jewess, and had accompanied her to Drablinka. Here, he was among the privileged and was attached to a working party. With his own wives, eyes, he had seen his wife, who was pregnant, taken to the gas chamber. Masaryk became one of the most active members of the committee. The plan of the uprising was to steal weapons and ammunition from the guardhouse, set fire to all camp structures, and attack the occupants by the prisoners from camps one and two. It was planned to kill as many guards as possible, to carry out a mass escape of inmates, and, after crossing the Bug River with survivors' groups, to join partisans in the forest of Ballystok. The uprising broke out on the 2nd of August, 1943, in the afternoon. It was Monday. There were no transports on Mondays. An atmosphere of great tension lay over the camp that Monday morning. The leaders needed all of their efforts to calm people's spirits. Finally, special inspectors came to see that the normal quota of work was carried out as usual in order to not arouse suspicion. Only the 60 people who had planned the coup knew the details. The activists were divided into two groups, and as soon as the signal was given, each group was to occupy the position assigned to it. At one o'clock in the afternoon, we got into file, as on every day, for roll call, the last roll call in this camp, because there was never to be another. But when the head of a group of workers, Galweski, told us that today work would finish an hour earlier than usual because Scharfer Rotner was going to Malkinia to bathe in the Bug Rigger, River, he winked his eyes slightly, as though alluding to the bath we had prepared for the Nazis. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the distribution of weapons began. Spirits grew agitated, and no one could keep the secret. The leaders, therefore, decided to start the revolt an hour before the agreed time. Before 4 p.m., the conspirators had stolen weapons, ammunitions, and grenades from the guardhouse with a key that had been duplicated earlier. Punctually, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, messages were sent to all groups with orders to assemble immediately in the garage to fetch their weapons. Anyone coming to fetch weapons had to give the password death, to which the reply was life, death life, death life. Cries of enthusiasm arose as the long-hoped-for weapons were distributed. At the same time, the chief murderers of the camp were attacked. Um, the watchtowers were set on fire with petrol. Captain Zelo attacked two SS with an axe and made his way to, take, to us to take over the command. There was chaotic shooting. Some buildings were set ablaze. And Stanislaus Lakbau from Morovan, Obstrova, employed in the garage, and who was nicknamed Standa, blew up a tank of petrol. However, the destruction of gas chambers failed, and the telephone line was not interrupted. The biggest attack was at the main gate, which was broken through after suffering heavy losses. Near the garage stood a arm German armored car, but Rudik had swiftly immobilized the engine. Now the car served as a lair from which to fire on the Germans. The armory was taken by assault, and more weapons were distributed. We had already had 200 armed men. The others attacked the Germans with axes and spades. We attempted to cut the telephonic communication and set fire to the gas chambers. We burned the fake railway station with all the fake signs and even the barracks which bore the name of Max Bill. Several kilometers away, a black column of smoke could be seen above the camp. From the commandant's office, Stagel managed to establish contact with units stationed nearby. The occupants from Malikia, Sokolio, Foldaski, Kosko, Laki, Ostrio, Mazowicka rushed to help. In total, hundreds of people were chasing the fleeing Jews. The uprising lasted 20 to 30 minutes, of which shooting continued for about 10. The flames and reports of the weapons roused the Germans, who began to arrive from all sides. SS and the police arrived from Costco, soldiers from the nearby airfield, and finally a special section of the Warsaw SS appeared at the camp. Orders had been given by the secret committee and those in charge of the rebellion to make for the neighboring forest. Most of our fighters fell, but there were also many German casualties. Very few of us survived. On the day of the uprising, there were 840 prisoners in the camp of which 105 did not participate in the uprising at all. They were mentally and tired and resigned people. 
It is assumed that only about 200 people managed to get out of the camp and escape the chase. Of this number, at most, 100 people survived the war. After the Red Army occupied these areas, about 40 survivors were found, so out of that 140, some of whom hid in the surrounding forests. The first meeting of the former prisoners of Treblinka II took place on the 21st of January, 1945, on the initiative of the Central Jewish Historical Commission. It was probably then that the Treblinka Former Prisoner Circle was formed, who held a meeting on the 15th of July, 1945, in the apartment of Oskar Strowski, a former prisoner of the extermination camp. The meeting was attended by 15 prisoners from the extermination camp and three prisoners from the labor camp. And that is the end.